guys, welcome to lecture 15 where we're going to be talking about the interstellar medium and the Milky Way galaxy. In this lecture we're going to be covering information on our own galaxy, which is the Milky Way, as well as what we see, things like interstellar reddening, why do stars get redder, what is this interstellar dust that causes our wavelengths to be reddened or, or, or shifted in one direction over the other. First off, what is the interstellar medium? The interstellar medium consists of gas and dust. Basically, it's the matter between the stars. It's collectively termed the interstellar medium. It is made up of two components, gas and dust. Gas is made up of atoms and small molecules. It does not block light. That's what's very important. It is mostly made up of hydrogen and helium, small molecules and atoms. Dust, though, is more like soot or smoke. It consists of clumps of atoms and molecules, making it able to actually block light from a distance. The dust will actually absorb a beam of light and scatter particles having diameters comparable or larger than the wavelengths of the light involved. Basically, the amount of obscuration of light increases with decreasing wavelength, meaning the smaller the wavelength is, or the bluer or more energetic it is, the more it will be scattered or absorbed, allowing for redder or wider wavelengths to get through easily. Light becomes reddened as it goes through dust. And this is what's known as interstellar reddening. A beam of light can be absorbed or scattered only by particles having diameters comparable or larger than the wavelength of the light involved. That means if you have particles having a diameter of, let's say, or we're gonna, pre I'm gonna make up a fake molecule. This isn't how molecules look, we're just pretending. Okay, let's say this is molecule A that is in our dust cloud. Our wavelength that is coming through happens to have a diameter, a wavelength, that is essentially the same as this molecule. This means that it can be absorbed or scattered by these particles. The amount of obscuration will increase with decreasing wavelength. So as our wavelength gets smaller and smaller and smaller, basically the closer we get to gamma, the, more, the higher the chance of it becoming scattered as it goes through the interstellar medium. How does interstellar reddening work? I'm glad you asked. Uh, dusty regions are transparent to long wavelength radio and infrared radiation. However, they will be opaque for short wavelength optical, ultraviolet, and X-ray radiation. Because of the opacity increases with decreasing wavelengths, stars will be quote-unquote robbed of their higher frequency or bluer components, making them appear redder than they actually are. The example we have here is Bernard 68. It is an it is opaque to optical wavelengths, so starlight actually does not pass through it. But near the edges is less cloud matter, which allows some light to get through. As we can see here, it's redder. It's red around here. It looks almost like fog. You are able to observe that the stars here are dimmer than the surrounding stars and also appear redder. If we look at the cloud with infrared light, it does come through, and again, the stars are observably dimmer than the surrounding stars, and they are much, much redder. It looks like you legitimately have a block of red giant stars. How interstellar reddening works is that light from a faraway star will interact with some interstellar dust. The dust itself will, will absorb the light that is of a smaller wavelength or more energetic, with the resulting light released being redder and dimmer than when it entered. The star's absorption lines are still recognizable in the radiation that reaches us, which allows scientists to see the star's true potential class, and so its color and luminosity. From this, astronomers are able to determine the degree to which a star's light has actually been dimmed and reddened en route to Earth, allowing an estimation of the amount of dust between the star and us as the observer, which is kind of cool. While no part of our galaxy is truly devoid of matter, the density of interstellar medium is actually extremely low. Gas averages at about 10 to the sixth power atoms per meters cubed. And that's about one atom per cubic centimeter. This makes an insane vacuum. Interstellar dust is even rarer with about one dust particle for every trillion atoms. 
Despite this, though, it can accumulate and will block light, forming kind of like interstellar cloud groups. It's distributed very unevenly, with some areas having little to none, while others have a moderate amount, which it pseudo blocks light, and fill other areas with so much we cannot see through it without looking into the infrared or radio spectra. The composition of the gas is well known from looking at spectra. Uh, gas has a similar composition to our sun and the jovial planet. It's mostly hydrogen, 90% in fact, 9% helium, and the remaining 1% is heavier elements. It is deficient in calcium, oxygen, silica, and magnesium, and iron, which is assumed to be the makeup of the dust. The interstellar dust composition is not well known. Some infrared evidence of silicates, carbon, and iron support that it formed from the gas, but it's most likely also going to contain dirty ice or water ice combined with trace amounts of ammonia, methane, etc., like comet nuclei. Nebula are cool areas of space. It's where stars are born. Astronomers use the term nebular to refer to any fuzzy patch on the sky, both dark or bright. So this is a nebula. That's a nebula. It's, they're just so cool. Emission nebula tend to have newly formed O or B class stars, which are the hottest types. These produce a lot of UV light and the UV photons will travel outward from the star. As they travel, they heat and ionize the surrounding gas, which causes the electrons to get excited, and they'll recombine with nuclei and emit visible radiation, causing the gas to glow. And this is what we see when we look at nebula, and that's what a lot of people think. For example, the Crab Nebula, they have these beautiful colors. Nebula, clouds of interstellar dust and gas. If it obscures stars behind it, resulting in being seen as a dark patch, it is known as a dark nebula. But if the cloud is lit from within by a group of hot young stars, like what I just mentioned, and glows pink, it is known as an emission nebula, like what we see right here. They glow red due to the hydrogen alpha line of the hydrogen getting super excited, so you're having the electrons jump from the second to the third orbit, allowing it to, to glow, because remember it emits a photon. Within these nebula are dust lanes, which are areas of dust and gas that happen to lie along our line of sight. Reflection nebula occur when starlight reflects off of an intervening dust particle along the line of sight. It is blue because short wavelength light is more easily scattered by interstellar matter back towards Earth and our detectors. Emission nebula are the result of UV radiation from one or more hot stars ionizing part of an interstellar cloud. Basically what happens is uh, we have red light emitted by a nebula when electrons and protons recombined from hydrogen atoms. We have visible starlight, re-emitted visible light. We have this dusty cloud here that creates a reflection of that coming back at us. So we have the scattered blue light coming at us and the unscattered red light going off. If it's not along our line of sight, it will look bluer. If it is along our line of sight, it's going to look redder. The interaction between stars and nebula creates some really beautiful imagery, like the Evil Nebula right here. As stars form, they actually will disperse their nursery with their radiation. So remember we talked about how the sun creates these, these solar winds. That is the radiation from the sun coming off. Interstellar radiation from a star will eat away at nebula. Basically, it removes less dense material first, which creates these beautiful works of art. The dispersing of a nebula through the radiation is called photoevaporation. Think about it this way. If you have a, a piece of paper in front of you that has sand, dust, dirt, all different particles you can find in your garden, and you were to blow on it lightly or fan it lightly, your less dense material will move away faster than your, less de than your denser material. Your pebbles, for example, won't move for a while, but your sand and some of your dirt particles will start to move away. This is what's going to result in the process in when this happens in space is these beautiful works of art just because these stars are forming. And we can actually see that here when we look at the frequency. This is how we know the spectra of a nebula, which allows us to then look and say, oh, hey, spectroscopy, you can tell me something cool here. What is the composition of this nebula? It looks very similar to our sun, actually. It indicates temperatures of about 8,000 Kelvin. And this is how we know that this is how stars are formed because the, so it's very similar to what our sun is, so we can assume our sun formed in a solar nebula as well.
99% of space, though, is just simply simply dark. There's no stars, no nebula, no nothing. The average temperature of these regions are about 100 Kelvin, which is quite cold. Within these areas are dark dust clouds. These are cooler than the surroundings, with temperatures reaching about tens of degrees in Kelvin. Thousands of millions of times denser than their surroundings, which allows us to distinguish them from the interstellar medium. Many of these are bigger than our solar system and can be parsecs across. They are composed primarily of gas, but the dust within them does lead to the absorption of visible light and the emission of radio waves. We do get some pretty distinctive dark dust clouds, like the Horsehead Nebula, which is over here. Super neat, super beautiful. I love these. How do we measure these? We use radio astronomy. Previously, we talked about how certain things are measured, the tools of astronomers. Radio astronomy is one of these. As these clouds are predominantly hydrogen, scientists naturally study their hydrogen emissions, which is where radio astronomy comes in. The release of a photon due to an electron being in the opposed state to its, its proton, remember, causes a photon to release. This emission line created is known as the 21 centimeter line because its wavelength is actually 21 centimeters long, which is pretty wide. Since the wavelength is so long, it's not actually affected by any interstellar medium or debris between the cloud and us, making it so we are able to easily measure it. Molecular clouds are areas of cold, neutral gas where densities reach as high as 10 to the 12 particles per meter cubed. And most gas particles are not atoms, but molecules. Only radio radiation can escape these molecular clouds, and molecular hydrogen is the most common in these clouds, but it does not emit or absorb radio radiation, meaning we cannot actually use it to observe the molecular cloud. Instead, astronomers use radio observations of tracer molecules like carbon monoxide, water, and formaldehyde in order to observe these clouds. Molecular observations reveal that the star-forming regions we observe are actually part of a much larger molecular cloud and groups of clouds known as molecular cloud complexes. Molecular clouds are bright emission nebulae which burst out of its parent cloud when the radiation from new stars heats and ionizes the cold molecular gas. We know about 1,000 molecular cloud complexes that have formed in our galaxy, but why are the molecules only found in these molecular clouds? Well, their density protects the molecules from the harsh environment of space. Remember, space, not nice. The same absorption that prevents high frequency radiation from getting to us also prevents it from getting to and destroying these molecules. Dust grains in the clouds provide starting points for molecule formation. Star formation is very important. We all like stars, we like our sun, it keeps us warm, gives us light, etc. Star formation begins when part of a dust cloud begins to contract under its own gravitational force. As it collapses, the center becomes hotter and hotter until nuclear fusion begins at the core, triggering star formation. The causation of contraction is not actually well known. There are many factors that could actually begin this process, such as two gas clouds colliding, a shockwave from a supernova. There are a lot of things that could potentially cause a chain reaction to begin. There are multiple stages to cloud formation. We're going to go over all of them. So stage one is the interstellar cloud formation. Contraction begins due to some outside force, again, supernova, something. As the cloud is compressed past the point where gravity overcomes gas pressure, it will begin to fragment into smaller and smaller, smaller clumps of matter due to gravitational instabilities in the gas. Depending on cloud conditions, this can lead to a few dozen stars larger than our sun to form, or thousands of comparable or smaller sizes to our sun. Fragmentation of the cloud is eventually stopped by the density of cloud fragments. As the cloud continues to contract, it radiates energy into space, resulting in the smaller cloud to not be much different in temperature from its parent. As they contract further, the temperature and pressure will rise, increasing density and ending fragmentation. After several tens of thousands of years, the stage two fragment will have shrunk into a gaseous sphere with a diameter of about our solar system. The central temperature would have reached around 10,000 Kelvin, and now it is a stage three fragment. At this stage, the fragment is opaque at its center, very dense and hot, and it is now called a protostar. The protostar will continue to shrink due to its internal pressure, not yet being able to withstand the force of gravity. By the end of stage three, 
the protosphere is visible. An example of a protostar forming dust cloud is the Orion Nebula, which is in Orion's belt, or near Orion's belt in the Orion constellation. And this is the nebula itself in picture two. And then when we go to picture three, these are a bunch of baby stars or protostars. The protostar will continue to contract until it reaches a temperature of 1 million Kelvin. Protons and electrons at this point have been pulled from their atoms and whip around forming the star. Internal temperatures will still not have reached fusion height, but at this point, the protostar would be 1,000 times the luminosity of the sun due to the release of gravitational energy as the protostar continues to shrink. Material from the nebula will continue to rain down into it, allowing it to continue to gain mass. At this point, the wavelengths of the star are more energetic and can be detected on the infrared frequency. At this stage, the protostar can also be plotted on the HR diagram and its evolutionary track can be monitored as it evolves. The protostar, though, has not yet reached equilibrium, so the balance of internal pressure and gravity has not been reached. At this stage, the protostar will move down and to the left slightly on the HR diagram. It is now about 10 times the size of the sun and has an internal temperature of 5,000 Kelvin. The gas in the nebula is now completely ionized, but still it is not hot enough to begin nuclear fusion. The protostar will have violent surface activity, strong protostellar winds, known as Titari phase. Titari was the first protostar to be observed by us, and so that's why it is known as a Titari star or Titari stage, which essentially is, hello, I have strong interstellar winds. Evolution from a protostar to a star will cause a jet of energy to be pushed out of the star as it forms, which looks super neat in a picture. Now we're going to move on to stage six and seven. So over here we can see we have stage four. We, are on, we were just talking about stage five, and now we're going to go to stage six. Stages four to seven can be followed on the HR diagram. About 10 million years after reaching stage four, the protostar finally becomes a star. At stage six, the internal temperatures have reached 10 million K, and the star now has a diameter of 10,000 kilometers. At this point, we have reached the temperature and the size and pressure balance where nuclear fusion can begin to occur. Over the next 30 million years, the star contracts further, becoming a stage 7 or main sequence star, and it will remain here until hydrogen fusion ends. The internal temperature at this point is 15 million K, with a surface temperature of 6,000 6, Kelvin and an internal pressure and gravity are at equilibrium due to hydrogen fusion, which causes hydrostatic equilibrium. For our star here, this is why the internal pressure temperature is 15 million with a surface temperature of 6,000. If our protostar started up here, we would have a much higher surface temperature and internal temperature. I just wanna make that clear. For this star, we are looking at a sun-like star. This is our example through all stages. Stars of other masses will also be shown on the HR diagram as they evolve. We can show the evolution of stars somewhat more and somewhat less massive than the sun. The shape of the paths are similar, but they do wind up in different places on the main sequence. So here's our sun, here's more massive than our sun and less massive than our sun. More massive protostars will create more massive stars and vice versa with smaller stars. The main sequence stage is where stars will live most of their lives, but where they end up on it will determine how long that life actually is. Brown dwarfs are very fascinating because we can't really see them. It, it wasn't until sometime in the 1990s, I think, or 1980s that scientists were actually starting to see brown dwarfs. Uh, but if the mass of the original nebula fragment is too small, nuclear fusion will never be able to begin. And these failed stars are known as brown dwarfs. A lot of times brown dwarfs form because you have so many super giant stars, like very massive O or B type stars that are blue. And we think, or scientists believe, that these failed stars or brown dwarfs look more akin to our gas giants, such as Jupiter, even though we've never actually been able to see one. This is what we think they look like. Star clusters are a collection of stars that have all formed from the same parent cloud and lie within the same region of space. Remember, they're not going to be sitting right next to each other and saying, hey, dude, how are you doing today? No, they're going to be parasites or light years away from each other, but they're going to have formed in the same parent cloud. Loose, irregular clusters found mostly within the plane of the Milky Way is known as an open cluster. These will typically contain a few hundred to a few tens of thousands of stars and are only a few parsecs across. In this case, you're going to have 
a very densely packed star cluster. You're going to have a lot of stars in a small area. You might have a bunch of binary or trinary stars, but generally they're going to be separated from each other. A less massive, more extended cluster is known as an association. They typically contain no more than a few hundred stars spinning, spanning many tens of parsecs. A globular cluster is a roughly spherical cluster of stars that's found in the Milky Way plane. These contain hundreds of thousands of stars, but they are spread out over about 50 parsecs. These contain no upper main sequence stars, indicating that all their O to F class stars have exhausted their fuel, meaning these clusters are at least 10 billion years old. Now we're going to see pictures of these. This is what an open cluster looks like. They are mostly going to be main sequence stars versus a globular cluster where we can actually see we have some main sequence stars, but we have many that are starting to reach their death stage. So a lot of red giants, meaning that they're much, much older. Whereas an open cluster shows that it is, in fact, much younger. That we have a lot of adult stars versus elderly stars. The presence of massive short-lived O and B stars can profoundly affect a star cluster, as they can blow away dust and gas before it has time to collapse, which can result in smaller stars being frozen in the mass that they are currently at, really stunting their growth, growth and explains the presence of brown dwarfs, which are stars that may have been starting to form and may have been gaining mass, but now, you know, these O and B stars that were short-lived and created early blow away all of the material that would be needed for that brown star, brown dwarf, in order to become a fully fledged star. A galaxy, in this case our Milky Way galaxy and all galaxies, are a gargantuan collection of stellar and interstellar matter. You're going to have stars, gas, dust, neutron stars, and black holes all together, isolated in space and held together by their own gravity spinning around. The Milky Way is the galaxy that we inhabit. Uh, it's where we have our solar system, it's where we have other solar systems that we have found around us, and it is also where we have our own black hole. As of 2017, uh, NASA has determined officially that the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy, and I have the source here for you guys to go read. It's actually a pretty interesting article, and we can go here. This is the picture that they have in the article showing the galactic bar. Uh, which is essentially, so how, how these are formed, or how these are made up of, what these are made up of, is you're going to have the, the arms, you're going to have the central bulge, and all of this is going to be on a flat disk. So you're, if you looked at it sideways, it would look like this, which kind of looks like a, a, well, the spaceships from old 1960s alien movies, right? And in here, in the disk, you're going to have the arms, which are spinning around. And in the galactic bulge, you'll have the core as well as the galactic bar. And the galactic bar is a bit of interstellar matter that happens to pass through the nucleus of the galaxy, which is really, really cool. So, all right, I'm going to stop the video now. In figure A, we have a the Andromeda galaxy, which is another galaxy similar to our own. It is a spiral galaxy. It is actually our nearest neighbor, and scientists believe that at some point in the future, our two galaxies will in fact collide. In figure B, we have M101, which is seen clearly face on. We can see a similar structure to the Oru galaxy. It is also nearby to us, and it also has these spiraled arms. And then in C, we have NGC, which is seen edge on. We can see the central bulge of the galaxy very clearly and the disk. If you notice, this kind of looks like a flying saucer. The galactic bulge is the center of the galaxy, whereas the disk being the flat circular disk of matter surrounding the galactic with the galactic bulge at its center. This is where in a spiral galaxy, your arms are going to be located. This is where the majority of your stars are going to be found. The central bulge is going to have a lot of stars. It's also going to be incredibly active. There's a lot going on there. It's very energetic. It's actually kind of dangerous for stars to form and not a place where you want to live. The bulge and the disk are both embedded in a spherical ball, which I'm going to outline here in blue. It's almost like a spherical ball, kind of like a halo of faint old stars known as the galactic halo. So there are stars out here. Not all of the stars are in the bulge or in 
the disc. They actually form out here too, and they're much, much, much older. Our sun is located on the galactic disc, and if we were to look up from our galaxy, we wouldn't really see many stars. But looking into the galaxy towards the bulge, we would actually see plenty. So again, let's review this. Galactic disc, galactic bulge, galactic center. This is an artist's conception of the Milky Way from afar. This is a real image of the Milky Way from the looking inside. So if we are looking along the white arrow, this is looking towards the galactic center. In the 18th century, we started trying to measure our Milky Way. William Herschel tried to estimate the shape of our galaxy simply by counting how many stars he could see in the sky at different directions at night. I want to point out, have any of you ever tried to count stars when you were younger and realized how fast you gave up? If you were to do it right now, you would be like one, two, three, four, five. Maybe you'd get to 10 or 15. You'd be like, wait, did I count that one already? Oh, shoot. Oh, no. Oh, darn. Oh, heck. I missed it. Where did it go? Uh. But remember, we learned every night the night sky looks different. So there is a high chance that he may have counted the same stars multiple times. He may have counted stars that you wouldn't see later and so then had to count new areas. Or he just didn't count a lot of stars at all because it changes and he just assumed maybe he counted them already. Well, he flattened out his idea and formed the image below with our sun near the center because, of course, we like to be near the center of things. Um, and this is an early model of the solar of our of our galaxy. I'm going to give him some credit here that he did a lot of work for this and I cannot potentially imagine how hard this would be and I feel really bad for whatever intern worked with him on this. Herschel was unable to properly map the galaxy as we know. His estimations created a galaxy that was only two kiloparsecs thick and 10 kiloparsecs in diameter. The galaxy is actually several tens of kiloparsecs across and the sun lies far from the center. It was in the 20th century that we figured out how to create an accurate measurement of the galaxy, and we did this using variable stars. These are stars whose luminosities change significantly over short periods of time. We have already encountered variable stars such as nova, supernova, and related phenomena, which are called cataclysmic variables. Pulsating variables stars vary cyclically in luminosity, not pulsars. Two types of pulsating variable are the RR Lyrae and the Saphid variables. These are also known as intrinsic variable stars because their luminosity varies in a regular way, but much more subtly. RR Lyrae um, pulsate in a very similar way. Observed peaks range from 0.5 to 1 day. They can be recognized and identified just by the light they emit. And they are found in the instability strip of the HR diagram, which we'll go over in a second. If you look at it here, the period and variation that it makes essentially makes shark teeth. Saphids, though, pulsate in a distinctive sawtooth pattern. They can have very different pulsation periods and vary from 1 to 100 days. It can be recognized and identified by the light that they emit, and they are also found in the instability strip of the HR diagram. This is the instability strip. The variability of these stars comes from a dynamic balance between gravity and pressure. They have large oscillations around stability because of this, and they are found in here, which, believe it or not, is where we find a lot of our very large, hot giants. Saphids that vary slowly over long periods go from high luminosities and ones that have short periods which have low luminosities. Our Lyrae stars all have a similar luminosity in comparison to saphids. For saphid stars, scientists have created a correlation between average luminosity and pulsation period, which is period luminosity relationship. This allows us to measure the distances to these stars. RR Lyrae stars all have about the same luminosity, and so knowing their apparent magnitude allows us to calculate their distance. But saphids having a luminosity that is strongly correlated with the period of their oscillations, once we've measured that period, the luminosity is known and we can proceed as above, calculating their apparent magnitude and distance. Well, what do we use RR Lyrae stars for? Many RR Lyrae stars are found in globular clusters. These clusters are not all in the plane of the galaxy, so they're not obscured by dust and can be measured. This yields a much more accurate picture of the extent of our galaxy and our place within it. This is an artist's rendering of the galaxy after, uh, after the finding of the data through the use of variable stars. It looks really pretty. Much of the knowledge of the structure of the galactic disk is through radio emission. 
Whereas the galactic halo and the globular clusters formed very early, the halo is essentially a spherical thing. All the stars in the halo are super old and there is no gas and dust, whereas in the galactic disk we have much younger stars and a lot of star formation regions, which we can tell because of emission nebulae, large clouds of gas and dust. Everything in the galactic disks rotates on a plane and in the same direction. The closer to the center of the galaxy, the faster you spin, just like in our solar system. Surrounding the galactic center is the galactic bulge, which contains a mix of older and younger stars. The coloration of each area of the galaxy is determined by the prominence of stars. The halo is the oldest area, so their O and B-type blue giant stars would have already burned out, leaving behind the slower burning red stars. Whereas the galactic disk is full of newly new activity, so brighter O and B stars would outshine the yellow and red stars present. This is an infrared view of our galaxy, and it shows a lot more detail about the galactic center than the visible light does because it's clouds of dust, which does not impact infrared as much or radio. This is what the inside of our galaxy looks like. It's really bright in there. How did the Milky Way form them? The formation of the halo of the galaxy most likely involves the merger of smaller galaxies. Disk formation is believed to be similar to the formation of the solar system, but a much larger scale. Remember we talked about in the first couple of lectures how the formations of satellites around planets mirrors the solar system? Well, the solar system mirrors the formation of a galaxy. We live in a barred spiral galaxy, but how did we determine this? Radio studies gave us the best direct evidence for such uh, by studying the radio observations of the interstellar gas in our galaxy, astronomers have been able to map out its distribution and draw a detailed picture of our galactic disk. Uh, because of this, this disk shape, the inner parts of the galactic disk spin faster than the outer portions. Um, oh, and, and this causes the arms of the galaxy to drag behind forming a spiral shape. The image here, which is an older image, is an artist's perspective or an exaggerated perspective. But the idea shown in this image creates an issue known as differential rotation, meaning that the galaxy and arms could eventually coil up and disappear. If this were true, however, and the arms of the galaxy were tied to it somehow, spiral galaxies would be very short-lived and wouldn't have the number of stars and nebulas that we see. The leading explanation for the existence of spiral arms in, the case, in this case is that there are something called spiral density waves which are cold waves of gas compression that moves through the galactic disk, squeezing clouds of interstellar gas and triggering the process of star formation as they go. So the gas essentially slows down and becomes denser as it passes through the wave, basically creating a galactic traffic jam. This leads to the spiral arms that are defined as having denser than normal clouds of gas and new star formation as a result of the spiral wave movement. Since this means the wave pattern isn't tied to the galactic disk itself, it avoids the issue of differential rotation, which means that they would disappear. So this in itself means the spiral shapes are just patterns moving through the disk, not matter actually being moved from place to place. Over much of the galactic disk, the, patterns, the pattern is predicted to rotate slower than the stars and gas. So the galactic material catches up with the wave, which leads to glowing and slowing and compression. Dust lanes mark areas of high density gas, and this begins the process of star formation. Observations here that can be made is we can see the dust lanes, high density gas, can, we can see the formation of younger stars more towards the ends of the spirals and older stars towards the center. So we have our young stars versus our older stars. The best available data about our galaxy not only tells us that we have a bar in the middle, it indicates that we actually have two major arms. Astronomers are not completely certain that it is only two arms. However, the evidence that we have, which was in the article that I showed you earlier, shows that there are really two major, major arms, and they have determined that there are indeed two minor arms, which were originally thought to be two additional arms. So originally, scientists believed that we had four major arms to our galaxy, but now we realize it's two, definitely two. Uh, with two minor arms that have formed. And the two major arms do connect to the, galact the interstellar bar that passes through the nucleus of our galaxy. An alternative theory is that the star formation drives wave movement, not the other way around. The emission nebula created when these stars form and the supernova when they die send shock waves through the surrounding gas, possibly triggering new star formation. 
Computer simulations suggest it is possible for this theory to create spiral arms, but only pieces which are seen in some galaxies, but not the galaxy-wide spiral arms that we have seen. It is possible then that there is more than one process at work in these spiral galaxies. So it is very possible that both of these process ideas are occurring at the same time. Maybe there is a wave that goes through that starts things happening and then from stars forming and then decaying and dying and giving off supernova, more stars start to form creating these fragments of arms. The mass of the Milky Way is something that can be measured studying the motion of gas clouds and stars in the, of, in the galactic disk, meaning we take the total mass or solar mass, orbit size in astronomical units cubed over the orbit period in years squared. The orbital speed of an object depends only on the amount of mass between it and the galactic center. Measuring the galactic orbital speed allows astronomers to calculate the galactic mass contained within the orbit. The orbital speed of a star or gas cloud moving around the galactic center is determined only by the mass of the galaxy lying inside its orbit, which is the gray. So to figure out the galaxy's total mass, we, that means we would have to observe objects orbiting larger distances from the center, such as out here. Astronomers have found that the most effective way to measure the orbital motion of stars and gas at a greater distance from the center than our sun is with radio observation, since radio radiation is unaffected by interstellar absorption. This has allowed for multiple observations of stars at different distances and the resulting plot created, rotation speed versus distance from the center, which is called the galactic rotation curve. It is based on the equation from before. The majority of galactic mass would be found within the 15 kiloparsec region and would lessen after this point where luminosity drops, which is our dotted line. However, what we see is that the amount of mass within 50 kiloparsecs is 6 times 10 to the 11th solar masses. 2 times 10 to the 11th solar masses lies within 15 kiloparsecs. So that means there's at least 2 times as much mass outside of the luminous part of our galaxy, where stars, nebula, and spiral arms are. This means our galaxy is actually much larger than we previously thought, which dwarfs the inner halo of, the, of stars, though. Astronomers have determined that the luminous region of our galaxy is surrounded by an extensive invisible dark halo. But we have no idea what that's made of. So we thought and thought and thought. And could the stellar mass be black holes? There's probably no way enough could have been created. Maybe it's brown dwarfs or faint white dwarfs and red dwarfs. Currently the best star-like option. But what about those weird subatomic particles? It could be, although we don't have evidence for it so far. This is now what we deem dark matter. We can measure and quantify its gravitational effects, but we cannot understand its exact nature. It is dark at all wavelengths, not just visible light. It's not made up of hydrogen or ordinary stars. What we think dark matter is, is the brown, white, and red dwarfs, black holes, and those subatomic particles that we believe are left over from the Big Bang. Astronomers have gained insight into the distribution of dark matter through the use of Einstein's theory of relativity, which is a prediction that a beam of light can be reflected by a gravitational field, which has already been verified in the case of starlight passing close to the sun. Typically, the apparent brightness of a star will increase by a factor of 2 to 5 for a period of several weeks when this happens. So even though the gravitational lens cannot be seen, it can become detectable. How do astronomers cope with what would be so much data? Fun thing, automated telescopes view stars every several days and computers actually sift through most of the data. This allows for scientists to be able to lessen the load they then have to look at because the computer will say, oh, I have found an anomaly. Observations of such events suggest that low mass white dwarfs could account for about half of the mass needed for dark matter, but the rest is still pretty mysterious. We can look pretty deep into our own galaxy thanks to infrared and radio frequency. And we have noticed some pretty interesting things when we looked in other wavelengths. This is a view towards the center of our galaxy in visible light. The two arrows and circle inset indicate the location of the center, which is entirely obscured by dust. But X-ray imagery shows a region of hot X-ray emitting gas associated with a supernova remnant. Within lies a rotating ring of star forming molecular gas a few parsecs across. Doppler broadening of infrared spectral lines created by this central gas indicates it is moving 
very rapidly. So whatever must be at the center must be extremely massive to keep this gas in orbit several million solar masses. From all the data scientists have collected, they have determined the galactic center appears to have a stellar density a million times higher than near Earth, a ring of molecular gas 400 parsecs across, strong magnetic fields, a rotating ring or disk of matter a few parsecs across, and strong X-ray sources at the center. What does this add up to? If you guessed black hole, then you are correct. All this data indicates that the center of our galaxy is a supermassive black hole. The strong magnetic fields are thought to be generated within the accretion disk around the black hole as matter spiraled inward and may act as a particle accelerator creating the cosmic rays. We call this black hole SGRA asterisk, or by standards, the galactic nucleus isn't that energetic. But radio and X-ray and gamma ray observations show that it is a pretty violent place, not the place you would want your planet to be. Its total energy output is a W. If you remember the star scale we learned about earlier, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M, before the O was in parentheses a W, yeah, that's how much energy it has on the stellar spectrum. It wouldn't even be on the standard HR diagram. A W is what we use to indicate a black hole. Studies indicate that it cannot be larger than 10 astronomical units across, and it may be even smaller than that. Imagery taken by the Keck telescope shows the proper motions of many stars around the galactic nucleus, and the orbit of star S2 from 1992 to 2003 indicates the black hole is 4 million solar masses across. And I know that's a very exciting point to leave our lecture on. But generally, what has been determined is that all massive galaxies have a black hole at its center, and that's what's part of causing the whole thing to spin, which is pretty interesting. And that is the end of our lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys next time.